Jason Pratt is uh, the manager of beer education at Miller Coors, and you are here in studio with us, which is pretty amazing. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks um, for having me. Of course. So I we have done numerous. You know, obviously you already know this. Uh, tech people like to drink beer. Of course, right? Who doesn't, right? Well, that's everyone a, likes to drink beer, but right. tech people like that's all they can afford is beer. So, what are you guys sort of doing? What what is the the main thing for Miller right now? You know, it's interesting because we've got a crazy focus, and I'm actually with Tenth and Blake, which is kind of our craft and import division. Yep. Um, so, what we're really trying to do is go out there and. Um, make partnerships with some of these craft brands that are out there that are really on fire uh, in the market right now. Um, so we recently acquired uh, three breweries. Uh, we've got four total that came on in the last year. So St. Archer out in San Diego, California. Uh, we've got Revolver Brewing down in Texas. Uh, we had Hot Valley up in the Pac Northwest and then Terrapin in, in Athens, Georgia. Uh, but what we're seeing is that um, the American kind of light lagers that everybody's used to are still overwhelmingly people's favorite choice, right? That's where people go to uh, most often. Uh, but craft breweries and craft beers are really on fire right now, too. Um, so instead of trying to go and create beers that kind of fall into those niches, uh, it's nice to go out and partner with people that have been doing it and are doing a great job with it, too. And we brought on some fantastic partners. I was going to say, so here's the thing. I mean, I am personally, I'm not a big craft beer person. Uh, there's a company who I'm sure you you either have heard of or will be looking to uh, acquire in the near future, Low Res Brewery, which again, with tech, it's here in Chicago. Um, it's a bunch of guys who had some pretty good exits in, uh, in the tech industry about a decade ago. And they're like, well, do we want to re-up and get back in tech? And the one dude's like, I just love making beer. <laughs> and they started a company, and, and it's one of the first craft brews that I've ever had. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm more on the lighter side of the, of the beer game. But I feel like we've been in this like craft beer thing for so long that I'm wondering when – when are we like craft it out? When is what's how do you like how do you guys stay ahead of the curve with that? So it's I mean it's interesting you say that because I just saw the number recently um, five thousand and five breweries I want to say in the U S now is the number um, I think since sometime in eighteen seventy three was sort of the previous high that we hit and that was like forty one hundred uh, and that was about last year at this time so uh, about nine hundred more breweries so two and a half three a day essentially opening up here in the U S and there's something like another two thousand in planning so when you kind of look at this thing. Uh, it's it's constantly growing, and I don't know that we'll ever be completely crafted out, but I think what really happens is you start to see separation. So yeah. the cream rises to the top, sure. right? Um, and you're going to have a lot of breweries that are out there that are going to be uh, comfortable and fine with, and it's a perfectly good place to be with being that local neighborhood brewery. So you kind of have your, your niche market. Everybody knows your name at this brewery. You come in, and people are going to be happy kind of coming there. Um, and then what you're going to see is the breweries that are, are really doing it well and really have a unique story to tell and unique beers to, to give to people are going to start to rise to the top and they might start to go to that regional level and maybe even national but um but it i mean it's it's very interesting to see kind of how yeah, this industry expanded it's funny i guess for i was making a joke about this the other day i don't i don't think the guy was a i think it was a guy from finch beer i don't think he was real happy about the joke but um essentially i said like i feel like craft beer is essentially like the new version of the of the mobile app everyone's oh, yeah. got a craft beer everyone's got a mobile app uh, at some point we're going to start to like see it sort of thin out but the reality is i mean craft beer is a let's call it like a, a movement a culture has moved on to now you see all kinds of craft foods craft wines craft spirits everything is like handmade versions of this and that and sort of its own thing which uh to your point i think is gonna be really interesting uh with regions having their own sort of not just flavor of preference but uh you know access to ingredients access to different things when do you see all of the segmentation coming to where like there's its own sort of craft Southwest, there's its own craft New York, or is it already there? I, I think it's already there, quite honestly. And you go to the Great American Beer Festival, and it's broken out by region essentially. And you've got these regional plays, um, but there are breweries. And, and what happens there is that you get somebody that lives in New York that can't get these crazy Colorado yeah. beers that um, you know they keep hearing about. Um, so the line at these things is ridiculously long, right? So if you're that hot kind of new up and coming brewery that people don't get a chance to try, this might be their one chance. Um, so you see people making these, I mean, insane lines, right? Just to get a just to get a one ounce sample of some of these beers from across the country. Um, so the regional play is definitely there, uh, and those are really your direct. It's there's a lot of camaraderie in this yeah. industry. Um, but what you see too is that there's going to be some competition, right? There's only so many spots on shelves in uh, in grocery stores. There's only so many tap handles out there, and somebody's going to get squeezed eventually. Yeah. Um, so uh, the competition is really coming uh, in that local and regional play, uh, and the national brands typically do pretty well because 
they're always going to turn, right? The Miller Lights, Coors Lights of the World, Blue Moons um, are always going to find their spot on that lineup because they're, they're a trusted beer that everybody knows they can go back to, and it's going to be quality every time they go to it. Uh, I think the local plays are, are fantastic, um, but they're kind of jockeying for these spots. And you'll see some some bars actually now that will have a full lineup of local craft. Right? I was going to say, yeah. so there's, there's a couple, let's get into more like on the technical side of things, mm-hmm. and, and not to be over, overly technical, but you, you you have a master's degree in like microbiology and, <laughs> and other things, so and Anyone who says beer is low tech, uh, I mean, <laughs> what is for Michigan State microbiology mm-hmm. and molecular genetics? Yeah, no big deal. It's a thing, right? It's just I mean, like it's, a, it's a it's, thing. Yeah. You know, I was I, I was going to my communications one on one class. I can sit and talk, and you were obviously doing a lot more. Um, but the point I, as we start to get a little bit more technical here, I think that two things are going to be interesting to me, and I, and hopefully you can shed some light on it uh, for those who are thinking about you know whether it's microbrewery or anything really Mm -hmm. uh you mentioned uh, shelf space you mentioned the ability to manufacture and produce this stuff in a quantity that can keep a cost that you could actually afford to ship this to new york or wherever it is and i think what's going to squeeze a lot of the ones who are coming up let's say the ones in chicago to, to expand nationally is just simply there's not enough consumers that are going to be in California and New York and different areas of the country that will enable them to be able to efficiently and affordably create the product. And so I feel like there's a there's two natural sort of choices that, that they face, unless they're well-funded on their own, is to team up with someone, say, like Miller Coors, who mm-hmm. can say, listen, we've already got, we own shelf space across all these things. We have, you know, distribution lines across the world. We have the ability to, to make the beer and all these other things. Are you guys going to be looking to partner with those kind of companies and maybe partner less than acquire, or is that something that is you guys have to own it all the right? Well, no, we don't actually. And a lot of the partnerships that we've had, um, the original owners still own a stake in the company, yeah. right? So um, they've got a vested interest in kind of growing. Well, they almost the have to, right? Because they're the ones; it's their flavor. So it's like exactly yeah. right, and and they know the brands better than anybody else, and they've got a passion for it. And I think that's the cool thing about this industry, honestly, is that people get into it. It's not always about making money. I think that's the the end game yeah. for everybody is you want to have a successful business. But this is a industry that's really built on passion and you see a lot of these companies that started off with people that just wanted to get together and do something that they both loved with their friends right brew with your friends and you build it out um, but back to your earlier kind of question about you know distribution and things like that um, the beer industry is interesting because you don't sell as a brewery directly to kind of the retail outlets so the the grocery stores or, or bars um, you have a distributor network that's in between so It is possible for these smaller breweries to go and find that distributor partner that can kind of take care of their brands in a market, even if they don't have that local presence. I would say the toughest part is making sure that um, that distributor, you you kind of have these agreed upon things when you go into it, right? Your distributor is going to put this much focus on it, and you've got people out there that are essentially acting as representatives of your brewery uh, when you're out there. Um, But without a local push and without having your presence in that market, it can be tough. Um, It's a a dog-eat-dog world a lot of times, and, and local is is a big kind of flavor of the the moment right now for people. So if you are launching another state and you don't have that representation, you run the risk of having your beer sitting on a shelf for longer than you'd like it to, and then the quality isn't there. So then the first time somebody tries your beer, if it's not in the best shape, that's the impression they have of your brewery. Uh, Whereas if it's in your backyard, you can sit there and you can know for a fact, you know, you can go out and and do your own quality testing to know that this beer is in the shape that I want it to be in. This is the best representation of my brewery and my brand. I wonder, you know, it's interesting. I wonder if you see, I have, honestly have done no research. So if this exists, you can just laugh my face and sure. be the end of this conversation. Uh, I, we've had a couple of different groups of the wine clubs. Winester is one of them mm-hmm. that's been on our show, and they send us boxes of wine and stuff. And what, they, what they've essentially mastered, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but what they've essentially mastered that a lot of the wine clubs haven't is that they themselves went out to Napa, and they met with tons of small small batch companies that are doing literally like 1,000 cases versus you know 50,000. Mm-hmm. And they essentially say, okay, you guys are going to produce it. We'll store all the wine for you, and then we can distribute it to our club. Yeah. And that way they're not actually handling the wine and they sort of eliminate themselves. I haven't seen that exactly with beer. And I know that wine, of course, is a higher markup. So you can, of course, uh, send wine for 40, 50 bucks a bottle. Beer, it's, you know, however much you can pay. I wonder if the next move for some of the small local is to set up like a, a beer stir. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't exist, you guys get that on GoDaddy now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, beer stir uh, with a Y. Because uh, that's cool. Uh, Beerster.com, and we essentially send you, like, you join a club, and we send you all of these different types of, of beer from local small hubs. Have you seen anything like that? There or? are there are different things that do something similar to that. 
Um, shipping. Never mind. Don't go. Yeah, that. yeah, right. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, shipping. Uh, it, it's state by state, kind of what you can get away with as far as shipping, kind of alcohol. Well, yeah, that's what that I said. State, like right? wines are set up by, like, not to get into the weeds. Yeah. I, I pretty much live in the weeds, but uh, they have a, a set up that they are sort of essentially they're not distributing just like state to state. They can. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into like how and where from things are shipped so that they avoid all the state to state stuff. But let's assume that they figured all that market. I feel like that would enable people to essentially have like the freshest beer at any given time constantly coming through. Yeah, you'd like to think. And there are a lot of styles out there that you want to drink as fresh as possible. Yeah. Some of the IPAs and things like that, um, hop character is kind of one of the first things to fall off. So the fresher that beer is, the better it's going to be for sure. Um, so yeah, getting that stuff out there is, is definitely something you'd like to do. Well, why don't we kind of move into the more fun part here? Because you just sure. sort of did a perfect segue. Right. You are like the beer connoisseur of connoisseurs. Okay, sure, Pretty yeah. Close. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's, that, a, that's what Miller Coors owns. Like, term. In, I mean, term. in layman's terms, Miller Coors owns like, I don't what, what percentage of the market is Miller <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a, a it's a pretty decent percentage. We're somewhere in the uh, U.S. beer market, um, around 25, yeah. 30 percent. So, so a good, yeah. so yeah. a good amount. So if if you are the guy who is the head of education of manager of beer education, then you're you're the man. What are some of the your favorite? First off, of popular beers, what what are like the distinguishing characters or characteristics of those beers that maybe people like myself just guzzle them don't don't know what to look for? You know, so it's interesting. I think what you've seen in the craft industry today is that, and if you look at some of the sites like Rate Beer, Beer Advocate, the top, you know, 50 beers, 100 beers on there typically end up being beers that are really high in alcohol or kind of really bitter. So it's a lot of Russian Imperial Stouts and Imperial IPAs. Um, IPAs right now are are still going to be a thing, right? It makes up about a quarter of the craft beer market. But I think what you're seeing in today's market now is a little bit of a transition. And people are, are shifting their focus and they're starting to understand that intensity of flavor isn't uh, the only thing that makes it a great beer, right? So there's a quality of flavor aspect. So you see styles like Pilsner's that are a little bit more in balance, um, really coming back into the forefront and a lot of great beers. Uh, and, and they're beers you can easily find on shelf. I know you mentioned the $40 uh, wine bottles. I mean, there are beers that are $30, $40 yeah. too, right? I mean, well, barrel aged. one and, pumpkin one the other day. It was pumpkin and tea and mm-hmm. some other stuff, which is, I don't know what it cost, but it was not cheap. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, people are people are spending that stuff on beer now too. Uh, and you go into any kind of local sort of binnies, whatever it is, and you're going to find bottles of beer that are in that $30 to $40 range. Um, but getting back to the kind of the quality of flavor side of things, um, styles on that lighter end of the alcohol spectrum in that four and a half to five range as opposed to these nine, 10, 11, 12 percent barrel aged beers, I think are finding a lot more favor with people now, too. Uh, and the other thing that to me is is kind of that next up and coming style category are sort of the sessionable sour beers. So um, Goza and Berliner Weiss, uh, lightly tart styles, people are adding some fruit to them. Um, and I always kind of think of the people that grew up eating Sour Patch Kids and Sour Candy that have this affinity for these flavors that are kind of a little bit more on that sour or tart side um, are turning 20. Right, or in that kind of 21 to 30 range, and they're the people that you want to sort of go after as the, the drinking, uh, the legal drinking age consumers that you're going to focus on and say, okay, what do these people drink outside of the beer category? Um, how do we use that to build something that they want and bring them into the category? And Very I think that's kind of the, the focus. Very cool. Where do you see things going with like with Miller Coors as a whole with, with regard to that? Because I mean, you, you brought up a good point. Uh, a lot of the, we'll call them just millennials because that's what we always end up picking on. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them, <laughs> You know, are between obviously you're talking about the ones just turning 21, but let's say like 25 to 30 mm-hmm. are just starting to like have a palate that can actually understand this. And that for whatever reason, it sounds dumb, but as you get older, the palate just sort of changes and you go away from just keystones crushing them on my forehead to like maybe <laughs> tasting something for a little longer. Um, what are you guys working on to sort of harness millennials and, and get their attention? Yeah, I think it's you can't just do one thing, yeah. right? And that's the one thing you find is that the beer drinker of 30 or 40 years ago had their beer, and it was their go-to, and yep. they went back and they drank it all the time. And those drinkers are still out there, but I think what you're finding more and more I is I am that, one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You're born 30 or 40 years ago, right? But, I, I right? wasn't, yeah, but so, I yeah, drink no, like it. Yeah. It's fine. Um, no, but what you're seeing now is that uh, drinkers are a little bit more uh, promiscuous, I guess, for lack of a better word. And looking for something new and unique every time you come out. Um, so if you can have something in each of those categories for them, and, it, and some of the things are a little bit more non-traditional, I guess. Um, so things like the hard sodas, uh, that you know, so Henry's hard soda is one of the yeah. things that's in our lineup, Red's Apple Ale, things like that, that can bring in drinkers and 
not necessarily kind of trade them in within your portfolio. So you might trade somebody from Line and Google, Summer Shandy to Blue Moon, something like yeah. that, right? And you're, you're swapping the volume. But if you can use something like a crisp insider, let's say, to bring in a white wine drinker, um, then you're kind of trading out of that wine category into beer. And that's a good place for us to be. When are you guys um, bringing back Zima? So, you know, it was it was funny. So we recently um, kind of had the the we got acquired by Molson Coors, right? Yeah. So Molson Coors actually still produces Zima in Japan. Yes. So it is out there. So if you go to Japan, you can still find it. And they brought it in for the f- day one party. They brought in Zima from Japan. Our team that's so, all yeah. here right now is way too young to remember this. And I think you might remember. Do you remember the commercials for Zima? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where they would open it up and they're in the bar and the entire bar would freeze. Yeah. <laughs> Except for that one badass who had the Zima. Of course. And right? he just walked his way down the aisle and talked. To all the ladies. This what you didn't like, know that was this. actually uh, based on like it was documentary style uh, yeah. filming. So that really happens uh, in all oh. those commercials, right? So we need some Zima all over Japan right now. Bars are freezing. <laughs> so yeah. it looks like one of the most intimidating beers I've ever seen in my life. Oh, it's fantastic! It's like just a it, think of like uh, a Smirnoff Ice and a beer with a little bit of Russian and Japanese twist. Oh, sure. So yeah, oh, yeah. Good. That wasn't the, what I remember it as. Yeah, like just, 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 seeing, just seeing in it. the forest just reserve with the blue bottles. Right. Yeah. And just said like, oh my god, this is. Well, you guys own it, so it's amazing. Right. This is tasty. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Jason, coming in here. Uh, I wanted to kind of send you out on one thing before we kick it back to the guys here, is um, how much or how difficult are you when you're at the bar or you're out to dinner with like with the bartender where they just like, you know, he tries to pair your beer with something and you're just like, dude. No, I, you know, I'm actually, I, I typically don't tell people. I feel like you're what a server's worst nightmare. No, you know what? Um, maybe internally, right? No, I'm, ju- I'm, sure I'm judging. I'm judging face. more than you believe. Just no, ju- no, 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 I just don't. Judging the hell out of people. I honestly, I walk into bars and I typically don't say a word about it. And it's funny because my my wife will be with me and she'll kind of laugh because the the server will kind of say, "Well, can I tell you about? It? Can I make some recommendations for you and things like that?" And I always just sit there and listen to them and kind of just say, "Okay, well, thank you very much. You know, I think I'm going to go with this." Um, there's there's no point in being that you know that kind of cocky jerk to people about you know what you're doing and uh, the great thing about the servers uh, have more touch points to any of our consumers than anybody else so kind of making sure that they're they're happy and they don't have kind of negative reactions to you when you're in your bars is a pretty important well, thing. Well one of the one of the pluses that you do have is you have like a built-in way to get more time back in your life though. Oh yeah. Because you know now that if you just told people to stop telling you about the beer you'd carve out like three or four minutes every single outing at the end of the day you might get like an extra month in your life. That's true every minute counts too uh, and there's well, a lot I can do with counts. that. There's a lot of yeah, well, that's true. And I, there's a lot of beer I could be drinking with that extra. I was just going to so, say you know, the same I, thing. <laughs> the possibilities are say. endless, right? So, so where do people go to, obviously everyone knows where to go to get Miller Coors and mm-hmm. products like that. Where, what are some of the new products or best products right now out for people and where can they go to get it? Yeah, so um, for from the Blue Moon side of things, one of the beers I, I really am excited about, uh, Blue Moon Cappuccino Oatmeal Stout. Really nice one. So if you're a coffee drinker out there and uh, 21 plus, go out and check out uh, My Cap mom is a Blue Stout. Moon and a coffee drinker. See, it's, uh, we, we knew that, right? Yeah, so we knew that in developing that beer for her. So she's uh, she's our target consumer. So um, no, but that's a it's a fantastic beer, a really nice one. We've got some exciting stuff um, coming up. I think uh, for next year as well that I'm looking forward to um, playing around with some some different flavors. Mango wheat is one of the things that we're really looking at, and I think that's going to be an interesting beer uh, when that has a chance to come out. But um, you know, the return of summer shandy coming up uh, coming up to February March. So uh, look for that on shelves as that as that starts to hit too. Fantastic, yeah. Jason. Thank you so much for taking the time. And please, anytime you want to come back here uh connect with bennett or myself uh we'll get you an email before the end of the day here i would love to have you uh, back on to talk about all the new beers oh awesome thank you so much guys thank really you. appreciate it you can stream this episode and more on technori.com and you can stay up to date with our technori news feed and other tech bites by following us on facebook and twitter at technori or follow me at katoon boom that's a wrap mm-hmm.